this afternoon, and it is um, the beginning of a double header, I guess you'll call it. Um, we have the chair board meeting first, followed by our work session. Um, I do want to share that our public hearing and our, or remind everybody our public hearing and our work session that were scheduled due to not having materials that we needed. Um, those were postponed and it was posted um, all over our fairgrounds workstation uh, um, website. And um, so I wanted to make sure you knew that. If you would like to speak though during our public comment period, you have two minutes and if you would like to come up I'll give this to Christy and she can hang on to it and you can just go over there and sign up if you'd like to speak with us. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and read the legal notice and then I want to share just a couple of words to start. Um, as information for our audience, if you're not satisfied with the decision made by the Metro Board of Fair Commissioners today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of entry of the board's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact your own independent legal counsel. I wanna share that from the start of our deliberative process, my intent regarding the Bristol proposal was to be sure that our materials and our deliberations were shared with the public and the commissioners so that everyone would have the materials needed in order for fact-based decisions to be made. To that end, you can find anything that we have reviewed, discussed, or addressed in our work sessions or our meetings on the Fairground website. Thanks for bearing with us sharing your questions and your concerns, as well as your suggestions, as we navigate the volumes of information and essentially juggle our many calendars. Unfortunately, there have been some instances such that we haven't had the materials that we needed to effectively review and hold meaningful conversations as scheduled, necessitating rescheduling the work session and the public hearing. None of us can make a decision void of pertinent information, and I won't waste anybody's time when we don't have the materials that we need to do so. So thank you for your patience and the recognition that we are going to make our decisions based on all of the data, not just some of it. That said, I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting of the Fair Board Commissioners on Tuesday, January 10th to order. And I will move for someone to move for approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. Commissioner Hendricks. Madam Chair, I move that we accept the minutes as uh, received. Second. Commissioner Hartley is second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I am an aye, and the motion passes. We will now move to public comment time. Please note that we have two minutes per person. We will let you know when your time is up. And I would like to first call on Mr. Norm Parton. Please share your address for uh, 615 Brent Lawn Court, Nashville, 37220. Uh, before I start, I would like to remind everybody that when you are speaking to get close to your microphone, that it is hard to hear when you come back to hear. So uh, first thing I want to do is invite this council to a field trip to visit some racers and some race shops. On Sunday, Anthony and I, Anthony and I visited a race shop that was very informative and the racers don't have much of a voice and I think it is imperative that we figure out how to do that legally. I don't know what that corresponds, but if it's one at a time, it's one at a time. And I'm here to facilitate that. The second thing, uh, every one of these meetings, there's an A, B, and C in old business, and I would like to be D. Uh, there's opposing comments that go unchecked, unverified, and I think that somebody needs to have equal opportunity 
to correct some of that and make statements on behalf of racing and the racers from a local perspective. So that is my request. And if you can find a way to do the field trip, <clears throat> I'm ready to roll when you are. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like to now call on Mr. Rudy Kalis. Uh, my name is Rudy Kalis. I live at 7808 Aslan Court in uh, Nashville. It's in Bellevue. Um, now I grew up loving racing. I grew up in Milwaukee, very close to the Milwaukee Mile Speedway. Fell in love with some of my first races there. When I became the sportscaster at Channel 4 back in 1974, I made racing a priority. Got to watch Richard Petty and see these people and see how the community came together. It was just part of the mystique of Nashville to me. Uh, I did a little racing myself. I think there's a piece of my head still in turn four where I had a crash there a number of years ago, but came back and did it again. I just see this track as part of the nostalgic power of Nashville. It's country music. It is what we, what people come here for. It, it's, uh, it, it's something that just draws people together. And it's just been a delight to be a part of it. And, and with the idea of them making it look better and dressing the lady up and the history of what has gone on here, the people that have been here, I think it's a tremendous draw to be able to get people that come in for, to visit Nashville it is so close to be able to sense and feel and, and the fact that they can do things besides racing here. Just a wonderful place that I've always loved. And I certainly have left a little piece of me in the corner of it. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like to call up Mr. Jimmy Veach. Hello, I'm Jimmy Veach, uh, 6577 U Daily Covington Road, College Grove, Tennessee. And yes, that is Williamson County. Um, been involved here at the fairgrounds with the raceway for, I'm almost 50 years old. Probably my first time here, I was probably 12. Uh, my son has grown up and we race here competitively. Uh, he was the champion of the Bandolero division this year, uh, here as well as Huntsville Speedway. Um, we're moving up to the Legends division and uh, we want to see this thing continue for these younger generation of kids coming up. Uh, gives them a local place to go and, and race and be involved not only from a racing perspective, but their multiple jobs, uh, engineering, uh, all, all those things that they can move forward to being involved with this. Thank you. Thank you. And I think this is Gavin Beach. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Gavin Beach, 6577 Yale Covington Road, 37046, College Grove, Tennessee. Um, Fairgrounds has been a staple in my bloodline for three generations now. I've been lucky enough to carry that on. Um, me and my dad, we run our Bandolero and now Legend shop out of our backyard and our, uh, at our house. Um, Fairgrounds has meant so much to me. Not only have I been able to race competitively for the past two and a half years, winning championship and rookie of the year last year. I've been able to make lifelong friends and lifelong memories with my family. Thank you. Thank you. And Shay Sapp. Hello, my name is Shay Sapp. I live at 151A Rains Avenue, Nashville, Tennessee, 37203. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak for a minute. I'm the board chair of SNAP, which is the neighborhood group in Wedgwood, Houston. Um, we've spent uh, the last month or so since the proposal was first uh, revealed and the details came out working with our community and other communities around us. It culminated in this letter, which I've also emailed to everyone, um, but I wanted to bring hard copies so everyone has it as well. I won't read the letter. Um, you can read it yourself. and. The dialogue is going to continue and we appreciate that but i also want to make it clear what exactly we're asking for because it seems like the pro racing side you might say thinks that this track goes away if this proposal is rejected and that's not true and i wanted to be known that the community and the communities that signed this letter are not looking for the end of racing at the fairgrounds and um, this is available on our website too if anyone else wants to know what's in here or wants to discuss with us as well Thank you, Shay. We'll put that on the website.
And I'd like to ask Joe Williams to come to the podium, please. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity. My name is Joe Williams. Address is in Franklin, Tennessee, 37064. No, that is not inside Davidson County, but it is very much a part of the Metro Nashville survey area. And the, the, we can tell you all the history. You've heard all the history of this racetrack and you've heard the reasons uh, for and against. But the biggest thing I want to tell you is that the biggest positive here is the community and the definition of the community. I grew up in Nashville. My blood bleeds Nashville. I travel the country and the Northern Hemisphere and people say, where, you know, where do you live? I say Nashville. I don't say Franklin, I say Nashville because this community has grown that much. It has exceeded obviously the boundaries of, of county lines or whatever. So is this racing community. And the, the idea that we can continue to grow this community and to define it not as political lines or just an eight or 10 block section, but bring the entire community a place to come to, to enjoy and to create tremendous economic opportunities for this immediate area, I think it's just a positive all the way around. And I, I thank you again for your time. I know you're going to make your decisions based on the entirety of the facts that you have. I'm pretty confident that you will find the facts to be in favor. Thanks. Thank you so much. And Sutherland House. Hello, address is uh, 995 Mahon Road, Columbia, Tennessee. Um, I'm a wife, daughter, granddaughter, and sister of all drivers at Fairground Speedway, a former driver at Fairground Speedway, and hopefully one day in the future, a mother of drivers of the Fairground Speedway. This track for me and so many others doesn't just represent a sport, it represents family. I'm sure for most of y'all on the board also feel the same way about other sports or hobbies, whether it be football, hockey, hiking, soccer, that it is more than just a hobby or sport, that it is something that can bring family and friends together for a lifetime. Many of us in the racing community are multi-generational racing families, and that is why we are very passionate about making sure the Fairground Speedway continues to succeed is because we want our children, grandchildren, and new families to have the ability to behold the substantial impact that this track has had over so many of us. In 2011, thousands came out in support of this racetrack and have continued the support in the fight to preserve this track. 69% of the District 17 approved the referendum. In the meantime, the taxpayers have seen two stadiums be built while the Speedway has seen minimal capital improvements and obstacle after obstacle to jump through. We are asking you, the board, to please act upon the thousands of voices and votes that have been ignored <clears throat> by the past administrations and to please look at the history of this track and its potential for the future, not just for the people who love racing, but for the kids who might find a passion in racing that they never knew they had and the benefits that an organization like BMS can do for the taxpayers and neighborhood also. Thank you. Thank you. George Saldana, please. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name, like I said, my name is George Saldana. I live at 62 East Thompson Lane. And I drive back and forth uh, to my day job and I've been doing it for 40 years through this neighborhood. And I've watched, you know, the trash and all that. But as a driver down here, I have done good to help this community with sponsors. And I put it back into like the Ronald McDonald House and in cleaning up the efforts in this neighborhood. But I think if you guys were to, to build this place like it should be, you're gonna see a lot of uh, improvement in this Davidson County that we need. Um, it's just, I've been racing for almost 30 years. Uh, I even broke my back out here. 
uh, but I've I've had, I probably have 600 friends from from this place that would give the shirt off their back to help anybody out. Uh, they're not a bunch of rednecks that a lot of people think we are. This, uh, these race cars have a lot of money, $60,000 in these cars. And I think if you guys get NASCAR here, you're going to see what it will do to Nashville. It will help. Just like Five Flags in Florida, what they do every year. And, you know, you're only going to have a couple of races a, re a year. And it's going to, the economic, what you'll see out of that is going to be unbelievable. But anyway, I appreciate the time. And, and uh, I think you guys will do the right thing. Thank you so much. Um, Shane Smiley. Good afternoon, Shane Smiley, Brush Hill Road, Nashville. I've been attending fair board meetings now for almost 28 years. And over that 28 years, we've seen a lot of things happen, including this facility become a department of Metro. About 28 years ago, they made you guys get your, a Metro attorney instead of your own. You no longer paid your own bills. You started paying into Metro for your phones, your equipment, everything else, and watch the over $8 million go away. There's $8.6 million in the account that was taken out and never given back in the time frame when they were building the stadium and uh, the arena. We've watched capital improvement after capital improvement go and new stadiums be built while we continue to pay our taxes. And we've done so because it's for the betterment. Parks money doesn't get a return, but it's a return on better quality of life. The sailboat marina, the golf courses, none of those are subjective to what is going to be the return on the investment because it's a better quality of life for the people. So as we've paid our taxes due to it for many, many decades now and watched capital improvements be spent all over the county and other places besides the fairgrounds, we've been asking for 20 years for a new sound system and have yet to get it. So we're asking as you go through this to not be as concerned about who's going to pay for the bills because the people have been paying the bills for things that other people like to do for decades in this city. And now it's time for those of us who enjoy racing and are part of the racing family and that future of what racing is going to be to have our due and to see this facility that has been overlooked for so many decades that even after the people spoke, 73,000 voters voted to keep this facility in this speedway. It's time for us to see the improvements that are due to that. And I also want to echo, I, echo, I agree with Norm Parton. We need to have a counter to what is going on with the Neighborhood Advisory Group. In 25, 28 years of this, no group has had a monthly ability to get up and speak. Your two minutes is up. Thank you so very much for your time. Thank you. Kayla Miranda. Hi there, Kayla Miranda, resident at 926A Gale Lane. Um, I'm here to speak in support of Bristol taking over the track here. I grew up racing dragsters here in Nashville and at Bristol, and I want the same thing for my sweet five-year-old daughter. As a resident of 12 South, right at two miles away, my family and I would welcome this new venture, NASCAR, the teams, and the tours that this would bring in. Nashville's a tourist town. It's the only way we can sustain our growth. We need the revenue that tourism brings, and part of being a tourist town is welcoming that new growth. Blocking Bristol from our town would um, be Nashville taking a step backwards, but this track is not just for tourists, in my opinion. It's for locals just like me, like you, and so many people in this audience that are telling you that racing is a part of our families. This past year, 12 Titans games were played at Nissan Stadium, 17 games were played at Geodis Park, 75 sound games were played at First Tennessee Park. We're all here talking about five or six NASCAR games a year. I'm sorry, NASCAR races a year. That's not even close to being comparable to the other sporting events taking place in our town. And I ask that you consider and vote in support of Bristol taking over the Speedway to leave Nashville better than we found it. Thank you, and Bobby Jocelyn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Bobby Jocelyn, uh, right around the corner, 926A Gale Lane. I rise in support of this. I don't know how many more meetings this thing can keep on going and beating a dead horse to death. These people that have come in here, I'm really impressed to hear the stories they've had, 
the, the passion that they have for this city. Looking around here as a longtime Nashvilleian, this, fle this flea market used to be the biggest eyesore in South Nashville. And look around what we have now. Drive right past Geodis Park, beautiful. The Turner family building a residential complex right at the top of the hill right here. You know, I was looking at the list of noise we got uh, Indianapolis Speedway, Martinsville Speedway, Darlington, Richmond, LA Memorial, Charlotte Motor. These are huge NASCAR races, Indy, Indy 500. People live 500 feet from the Indy track. Darlington, 500 feet. Richmond, less than 600 feet. LA Memorial Gar uh, Coliseum, 1,000. We have all kinds of opportunities here for Bristol to come in here and make a major investment. The grandstand is sad looking. It needs a facelift. It wants to smile again, and these people can make it smile again if you give us the opportunity. So I rise in support of this, and I hope you guys will put this to bed and pass this thing for the city of Nashville and these great people. Thank you. Thank you so much. With that, we will close the public comment time, and we will move to um, financial update and our monthly reports. So, Therese. Hello, everyone. The financial information presented today is preliminary and our revenue and expenses for December 2022 may not have been recorded to the ledgers as of January 9th, 2023, when this report was created. The preliminary actuals through December 2022 are as follows. Revenue is approximately $1.6 million. Expenditures are around $2.3 million, resulting in a net loss of approximately $630,093. Depreciation expense is $567,400. So the total net loss is roughly $1.1 million. Below you will find an itemized list of our revenues and expenses. Our top three revenue sources are flea market, corporate sales events, and the divisional fair. Flea market revenue is roughly $359,500, which is 21% of our total revenue. Corporate sales events is around $709,600, which represents 42% of our total revenue. The divisional fare is $541,500, which represents 32% of our total revenue. Our top three expenses are payroll, purchased services, insurance permits, and low cap. Payroll expense is approximately $713,185, which represents 31%. Purchase services expense is $660,957, which represents 29% of our total expenses. Insurance permits and low cap expense is $210,700, which represents 9% of our total expenses. For the month of January, 2023, our revenue projection is approximately $108,651. We anticipate 28% collection of revenue from the flea market, 71% from corporate sales events, and the remaining 1% from the racetrack and contracts. On our agent report, we have approximately $63,509 in outstanding invoices. This concludes our financial report. Are there any questions? Any commissioners have questions? Commissioner Hartley. Thank you so much for the report. And I may have asked this before, but I just want to be reminded. So looking at the second column or second chart on page two titled revenues our budgeted revenues are 4.6 million for the year and we're year to date 1.6 uh with most of the year elapsed i know we have 2 million which essentially is the subsidy from the city to sort of meet meet that i believe that's to sort of meet the gap but the question is are we off our revenue projections or are we sort of on track to get there by the end of the year specifically i'm looking at the category of contracts which is we've done seven percent of what our expectation is there so can you kind of tell me where we are as far as revenue for the year we are on track as far as revenues from the year for the year the contract um we're down there because we have not recorded the twin the two hundred thousand dollar rent that we received from market street and that'll be recorded this month and so that will be on track 
So is it fair to say that most of the remaining revenue coming in this year will be that grant plus the subsidy? That'll be like 2.2, 2.3, and then sort of the remaining 700-ish to get us to the projection is just a continuation of yearly revenues from the other sources? Right, so you'll have the 200,000 for the rent. You'll have about, we have about 300,000 that we're looking for, uh, to receive for flea market we've projected. It's about 500,000 for corporate sales events. And so what we have budgeted as far as revenue uh, of monies that we will collect, we're on track. And then the $2 million from the city will close our gap. Thank you. Last question. Uh, and, and Laura, this is a question primarily because I'm new and apologies for my ignorance, but when we create our budget, how is the amount of that subsidy generated? Is essentially we look at what our potential revenue is versus our potential expenses and then go to the city to close the gap? Or tell me kind of how that comes together. You're exactly right. We do use projections. So we'll go back uh, to previous years and run numbers. For corporate sales, for instance, we can use uh, historical information. And then we also look at, for flea market, we knew we actually reduced our projection coming off of COVID. So we knew that we had to rebuild at that point. So we did adjust based on what we were seeing immediately following um, reopening after the pandemic. So a lot of historical data and then challenging ourselves a little bit too, because you know, we had every intention of growing our business and, you know, even the flea market is, is doing better than our revenue projections uh, because we are starting to see that trending up. Now, as far as the subsidy goes with this year, it was a little different because it was the first year of the Nashville Fair. So we worked really closely with our fair manager, Scott, as well as Metro Finance to calculate what that subsidy is. And so that was part of the early budget discussions. Um, and we'll, we'll start working on those right away in February for next fiscal year. So um, this year was a little bit different because we actually budgeted in the subsidy up front, which in the past, it was done later in the fiscal year to make up any gaps. I'm sorry, Sherry, I have one final comment. And then, this is just a comment. I mean, the elephant in the room as we're looking at this is we're considering sort of uh, essentially privatizing part of the, the fairgrounds in, in the Bristol proposal. And we really need to evaluate what impact that has. I mean, right now we have a uh, some really good positive direction revenue uh, streams that, are, that are, are, are happening, but we're also not covering the expenses. So we need to consider what's the impact if we take that piece out between, uh, you know, payments directly to the fairgrounds from the deal. Plus, you know, as, as I posed in one of my questions, what's the sort of lighter lift that the fairgrounds has now that they don't have to manage that piece? Because, you know, I think everyone would say that we would rather that be closer to, you know, a, a, a very small number as a subsidy where we're sort of more of a break even operation rather than, than sort of being uh, needing to be supported from the city. With that in mind, I will now say the exact opposite thing, which is this is also a public space for the city. And so we should consider, you know, how much we feel the need to be revenue neutral or revenue positive. Uh, right now we're revenue negative, but we should consider that. And that, I just put that as food for thought for all the commissioners. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Do any other commissioners have any questions or comments regarding the finance? Yes. With uh, the expected expenses down here, uh, we have to use all the subsidies since we're not going, it doesn't look like we're going to, uh, we don't need all of the expense money that we have budgeted. So Trace, what's your question again? We budgeted 4.6 million and right now for, uh, for expenses, and we're currently at 2.3. So uh, do we have to use all of the subsidy well, since we're not going to be, it doesn't like we're going to meet that 4.6 expenses that we had budget. Well, the, the way that this department works is it's an enterprise fund. So we are responsible for covering our expenses. 
So if you take the expense bottom line, which is 2.3, ideally, ideally you will want that top line in revenue to be 2.3. That means we break even. So because we're not breaking even, we will need a subsidy. So if we needed a subsidy right now, we would need a subsidy of $630,093. Correct. So we, we're budgeted for $2.2 million in subsidies. So what we do with the remains of subsidy if we don't need to reach the 4.6 in expenses? Well, what happens is last month, what happened last month was finance reassessed. We go through a mid-year review. And we have to talk to finance about where we are. So they'll say, you asked for $2 million at the beginning. It's December. What do you think you need now? So during that process, we decided that instead of the $2 million, given our revenue that we projected and how our expenses are occurring, we decreased it down to $1.8 million for the subsidy. So essentially, the subsidy amount could decrease? Yes. If we don't spend it all. We can't keep it. We cannot keep it. It has to go back to Metro. Are there any other questions? Commissioner Hendricks. Okay. We will move on to the event update and I'm going to turn the floor over to Executive Director Womack. And um, I am going to ask Laura to speak a little bit about our aging beforehand so that oh. we can get that addressed. Sure. So there are some, um, some larger numbers on the aging report that you'll see um, that I just wanted to address those larger numbers in particular. Um, one is the hemp show, and you'll see that that is a plus 90 day. I'm actually working with Miss um, Ann, Metro Legal. Uh, we're going to be pursuing collection um, on that amount, as well as uh, the remaining outstanding balance um, for Jingle Beat. And we are also in discussions on how to get that money, um, I'll be working with Ann on a, on a plan to, to get that payment made in full as well. Any commissioners have any questions about that before we move on? For, for both of those entities, did they pay anything up front? Yes, both did. Yes. So we bill, um, we bill ancillary rentals and such later after the event. So there, while that, those amounts don't necessarily account for all ancillary, but anything that is day of, because oftentimes they can project how many, you know, rental tables, chairs, pipe and drape. But once they get here, that sometimes changes. And so all ancillary rentals and final invoicing is done after the event. So there's two two processes there. Okay, thank you for that. You want to move to the event update? So in your packet is a calendar for January and February. You had received the January. Again, this is draft schedule may change. Um, I don't anticipate it changing, but uh, you will see um, what we have. And if you walked through uh, Expos 1, you will have seen a lot of dinosaurs. We have Dino um, Adventure here, which is great for the kids. We've done this show before, and it's very, very popular with families. So I do encourage you to come out for that. Um, we also will be moving in the Nashville Home Show here in Expo 3. Uh, this weekend, and then we will transition immediately to the to the RV show. And again, fantastic show. This is a full venue event. And then we will get into um, a private training event that will be outside. And then we also have CrossFit in the flea market on the final weekend in January. And then we are also sport, uh, hosting a corporate private event. Um, midweek, which is great. You know, we've talked about in the past our desire to increase weekday events. And so this is a really good opportunity for us to kind of get into that corporate event 
side. And then you'll see with February, we're just as busy with um, auto swap meet. That event has been at the fairgrounds for decades. It's a fantastic Stones River auto swap meet. And then um, we do have a new event that I wanted to highlight for February. Um, also, um, I want to thank Vice Chair Hendricks. He helped kind of facilitate this and bring this to us. And this is Nashville Black Market. And we are really excited to bring them to the fairgrounds because we anticipate that this is um, a several time year event and then, you know, certainly turn into a legacy event here. So we're really happy to welcome them. And then the Nashville show used to be known as Antique Tailgate, again, a show that has been with us for decades, as well as Fiddlers. And then we are hosting the state bar exam again and right into February Flea. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any event questions? I do want to just real quick, as soon as I can get my computer up, I want to update you a little bit on, as soon as my computer boots, um, just an event update because we have been working for a couple months now on kind of trying to refine our event management processes. We have new staff and we've had a lot of transition over the last 12 months. And so I wanted to go over some of the things that we're working on and we'll kind of be able to get to show you those once it's finalized, but we are um, taking a, a really a multi pronged approach to it. And one is to provide our clients and potential clients when they go to our website, all the information that they need so that they can download appropriate files, they can have CAD files, PDFs of our floor plans. So our website is currently being updated right now. Um, so I want to thank ITS for all the work that they've done already. I'm also working with um, Ms. Ann, I've sent so much work her way, but she is helping us um, make our license agreement, which is the contract that our clients sign um, when we book an event, make it more organized, I guess, a little bit easier to navigate from a client standpoint, and then updating some details in there with timelines and things that we're trying to stretch out in our processes so that we're not crunched for time when it gets closer to the event. We've also created several internal tracking tools. So we've had issues with you know, making, having conflicting events and we don't want that to happen again. So we have um, created tools such as uh, calendars that track the entire campus. So not just events that we do, but our campus partners as well. And then we also have a event booking status calendar that we use internally. So anytime, even if somebody is out, we can go in, take a look at it. These are all shareable files among staff so that you can go in and everything's color coded about where that identifies what stage of the process the contract is in or the event planning is in. And that is really helpful. Again, we uh, file share now pretty intensively so that anybody at any time can go and look at the file and it is updated and can be updated uh, live. Two more things we do. Um, we've implemented a more detailed event order and these are really important documents that is kind of that working document that communicates all the details of an event between the fairgrounds and the client. And so this is where we talk about ancillary rentals. And one of the things that we've done is starting to give them um, estimates up front. So they've always had our pricing. And so they can kind of figure that out themselves, but we're actually calculating it for them and presenting it to them up front before their event. So there's no surprises. And then they can manage their budget if they need to do any reductions or additions based on the total. Um, also, we've got a letter that is substantially drafted. Uh, we've got to add a few more things. Um, that'll be mailed out hopefully by the end of next week to our existing clients that updates them on all of these steps that we're taking uh, to our event management. So we are still working diligently on that. And so that continues um, to improve those processes. Does anybody have any questions about that? Commissioner Hartley. 
Number one, I just want to uh, commend all that activity. That's awesome. And I think that's really focusing on serving the events and being client focused is great. Two things. One, uh, obviously, I don't function as uh, a lawyer for the fair board, but I would like to offer as a uh, person uh, in the business community that works on events and license agreements quite frequently. I would love to uh, collaborate. And if you need any help, especially on the business terms, I'd be happy to look at that just to give you a second uh, perspective. Uh, second thing is, um, I believe we asked at a, a prior meeting, I, I may not have, but I, I wanted to include the road closures on this calendar or at least make those road closures available to the public. Um, I hate to, to harp on this so much, but I really view the Wedgwood extension as a big community uh, resource. And so I think making it really easy for the community to know when that road is going to be closed down for events. And also, in addition to just putting it on this calendar, putting it on our website, making it available to the public. Also, just trying to minimize that as much as possible. Um, you know, I think the other day we had the road closed for just a couple hours. So if there's ways we can sort of structure our load in load outs to avoid closing that road down as much as possible, it's, it's really a big community benefit. And we should think about the infrastructure that way. You have anything? Okay, I'm going to add one thing. Having had a bird's eye view and oftentimes sitting in the chair in the back room with them over the last year, watching the dynamic changes that have happened from an operational perspective um, with this team, we should all be standing up and giving them a huge round of applause because from Satrice and finance and Christy, who I have to tell to go home at 10 o'clock at night, um, and well, I do. And um, from all of the maintenance staff, this is a huge, huge undertaking. And I am extraordinarily um, thankful that we've got Laura and this team here to move this property forward the way it should be for the community. Um, it's, it's a really good thing. Um, having said that, we're going to move on to the executive director's report. Thank you. I have one thing, and I do see him in back, and I'm going to put him on the spot, and I want to just recognize David. David, you have to stand up. So David, <laughs> David's last day is Friday. Not sure what we're going to do without him. He is retiring. Um, we're going to have a little reception. I know that we've got a little break between this meeting and the work sessions. Of course, we have cupcakes and we're going to have a little reception for him in between before we start the work session. But I also wanted just to invite everyone and if you, especially our racers that are here, if you could pass the word, we're going to have an open house for David. Um, Friday from one to three in Expo two. And we would love for, you know, people to come and say goodbye. And well, it's probably not goodbye. It's see you later. Cause I'm sure he'll be back to the track, but if you could please pass that on, um, I would greatly appreciate it. I'm sure David would too. So David, thank you for 25 years plus, cause I know it's been more than 25 year, years at the fairgrounds. Um, and we will miss you terribly. Thank you, Laura. We are going to move now into old business, and I'm going to start by asking Mr. Melton to come up here and address mixed use, please. Oh, good afternoon, Commissioner Director Walmack. Uh, I'll be very brief on our Block C update. Uh, despite the extreme cold and rain we experienced in the past 30 days, uh, the wood framing is more or less on track. We expect to be caught up with that very soon. Um, we, that will continue for several more months as the building is framed up to its top level. Um, our haul routes and our material deliveries continue to be utilized via gate seven from Craighead to I-440, and that will continue to be the case uh, for some time. Uh, the big news and the change uh, starting next week is that our precast panels for our parking structure will start to arrive about a week from today. And so um, those uh, trucks will be delivering uh, the uh, columns and panels for the parking structure uh, that will be ongoing uh, through the balance of this year. We'll be delivering that uh, parking structure late this summer. 
uh, and that will be available uh, in advance of the delivery of the mixed use building uh, for campus events, which we're excited about. Um, so we're excited to see that uh, started. Uh, for now, we're going to attempt to have those panels delivered through gate seven also from Craighead and see if they, they can negotiate that hill up from the south. Uh, and we're gonna see how that goes. Um, in addition to that activity, uh, we also had uh, the ordinance approved for a participation agreement with Metro Council approved at the December 20th uh, council meeting, and that is for the design and the construction of Fair Plaza and for the right of way between Block C and the Speedway. And so that design process will kick off soon, uh, and uh, we're looking forward to getting that uh, started so that those facilities can be delivered uh, before the end of the mixed use building in fall of 2024. Uh, as always, we're grateful for our campus partners and we continue to work on what we hope will be an exciting project for the fairgrounds. So thanks so much. Thank you. And I'm going to now turn the floor over to Executive Director Womack. Laura. So in your package, you will see the um, updated financials, updated as to 30, 45 days. Um, as you know, um, as Mr. Henley always reminds us, um, I'm not gonna cover those today. We don't have an update from our project manager. Um, we did take their contract to council and ask for an extension, but unfortunately it was deferred on the third reading. So. Uh, that is kind of in a holding pattern until we can get that resolved in through council and get that approved and get them back uh, to work on our projects. So I do anticipate that moving forward the next council meeting um, as we work through some some things with the uh, extension with uh, with council. So no update there other than it's moving forward. And I will now turn the floor over for a Bristol Motor Speedway update. Matt? I'm sorry, Commissioner Weiner. I said, yeah, I, want, I'm sorry. I, I did have one note on number yeah. A, yeah. which is the, the, the contract was, was deferred from third reading uh, by Council Member Sledge. His primary concern was that they, they hadn't seen a lot of movement on Fair Park Phase 2. I echo those concerns. I think we should be pushing forward on Fair, Fair, Fair Park Phase 2. Um, it's going to take a long time to develop that. And I understand we have other moving parts on the campus, but that's an obligation we've already undertaken. And so I support that. I support holding that contract until we get an update on where Fairport Phase 2 is and where it's going. Because I think it's an important community benefit that we need to push forward. And I hope you all will also uh, support that we've put that money out already to, to do that work, and we should, we should start working on it. Laura, I'd like you to address that, please. So I have a preliminary update. Construction is expected to start in, in March, April. Um, they are doing design, finishing up the design documents and we'll go to permitting. So we've got a couple different phase, sub phases, I guess, if you wanna call that with, um, with the park, but we do anticipate that starting very soon. They are working on an updated timeline to see if they can compress that further with the contractor. And so I, I should have an update for you this week. Thank you so much. We will move on now to Matt with Bristol Motor Speedway. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. And I'll be very brief because I know we have a work session coming up, but I did want to take the opportunity to update you on our uh, neighborhood meetings and community engagement. Um, just as last week, we attended the NIAC meeting and we plan to attend an upcoming one as well. Um, had a good discussion and got to discuss some issues surrounding our Speedway proposal. Um, Currently plan to attend the SNAP meeting on January 17th and the Chestnut Hill Neighborhood Association meeting um, on January 25th. Um, we're in discussions with 12 South neighborhood to meet with them and we've talked about the early February meeting, but that hasn't, has yet to be confirmed. Uh, but we look forward to, to meeting with all those neighborhood groups and like I said, meeting with NIAC again as well. Um, Later, we have uh, Kimley Horn here to discuss a traffic management plan um, during the work session. And then my final update is I believe since we've met last, you should have gotten responses to our first round of written questions. So if you haven't received those, we'll gladly provide those again. And those should be posted soon as well, is my understanding. So. Yeah, we'll address that during the work session. Thank you. Anybody have any questions at this point for where we are? Okay, we're going to move on to community impact and a representative from NIAC. Hey, 
Hey, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I had a couple things before I dive in. I uh, just um, <laughs> always appreciate the opportunity to to come here um, with for, to speak for NIAC. Um, that this was something that when I was on the fair board, I thought was was long overdue. Um, with all due respect to some concerns about giving NIAC a little bit of time to speak, um, I don't really think you can both sides community impact concerns <laughs> um, unless you're looking to undermine them. Um, and I also would just remind the fair board as uh, that racing interests have had a, a paid astroturfer working for them for over a decade. He's, he's right there. Hey, Darden. Um, so, I mean, the community doesn't have anybody working for them. So giving a few minutes to share community concerns shouldn't be a controversial thing for what it's worth. Um, just a couple quick items for you. Uh, one is, is talking about the, that definition of race cars under the lease. Um, uh, I was speaking to a community group leader uh, or communicating over email uh, um, a week and a half ago, and, and his frustration was he didn't feel like the community groups had really been, been worked with. He, he saw that quote in the Tennessean that said the, the plan had been formulated working with community groups. And he said, well, we'd only had one meeting a year and a half ago. We don't really feel worked with. Um, and, you know, as Matthew alluded to, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to report from NIAC that we, we had a really good first step last week. We had a good meeting with uh, Bristol representatives. Ben Eagles was there, which was great. A um, little bit of short notice. We found out all this was happening when we got on the call. Um, so they've agreed to come back again. We can get more, more participation from more NEAC members if we get a little notice. But that was a, that was a great thing. We had a good dialogue. Um, we, had, we got to ask some questions. Um, and so that was, um, that was a, good, a good step. And I hope there's a lot more opportunities like that coming up. Um, and one thing we talked about was the, the race car loophole, the definition of race car, um, which is uh, very loose in the, in the lease, um, potentially would allow all current race cars to not count as races or race cars um, under, the, under the current standards. Um, and also uh, uh, doesn't account for other car events, other noisy days, as the sound consultant called it at your work session, day-over-day uh, -day noise, as Chair Wiener called it, uh, that she was concerned about. And, and what are these things? These are things like Sports Car Club of America events, like time trials and track days, high-performance driving experiences, racing schools, driving schools, tire tests, ride-alongs. All those things happen very frequently at SMI events, at SMI tracks. And we're still waiting on an answer on how many uh, of those events Bristol's envisioning um, of course, those events, they would get to keep 95% of revenue for. Um, but, but these events are noisy days, potentially, and day-over-day -day noise, um, like Chair Wiener talks about. And that really doesn't fit here. You know, it was really good to hear uh, Matthew and Bristol talk at, at the meeting that the NASCAR weekend probably needs to be a different kind of NASCAR weekend than they would have at Charlotte uh, or Bristol Motor Speedway. And I'm glad to hear... Bristol say that, I think you guys should ask a lot more about that, about how this NASCAR weekend can be different and less impactful. Well, just in the same way, those extra events don't really fit. Under the current promoter contract, any of those events I listed off, those would be track rentals, and those are limited to 25. Well, under the way this lease is written, all those events would kind of exist as an extra bucket, and that's, that's the concern NIAC has. How many days are we talking about? 50, 60, 70 days? That's not really compatible here. If we're going to hear what the, the supposed benefits of the proposal are, which is it's the race weekends and the limited track rentals and that's it, well, that should be it. And so with that in mind, um, I've, I've got a handout for you that I've handed out to some of you. Here's how to fix it. Thank you so much. Just a, just a little bit more there. Uh, here's, okay. it, here's, how, here's how you fix it. Um, you, you amend the race car definition to truly capture all possible race cars. And then you amend a couple other provisions of the lease to make clear that outside of races and track rentals, only street legal cars are allowed on the track, uh, which, which shouldn't be a controversial thing. And so I would ask uh, that the commissioners take a look at that and, and, and put that into the feedback that you can pass forward to really make a huge impact on, on making this deal a lot, uh, a lot uh, lower impact for the community. Um, so that's thing one. Thing two is you're about to have a, a session with uh, the Kimley Horn folks. 
And we talked a lot about parking at the last NIAC meeting. And I think there are a lot of current concerns with, with soccer games. And it, that's still a very much a work in progress, a lot of growing pains there. Um, the place where it gets better with soccer is game over game, people learn habits. And I think that's the big concern with, with the, uh, the larger racing events is those folks are, aren't going to be coming as frequently and maybe learning the habits. And so we would really encourage you to push hard that making sure that Kimley Horn is not just sort of saying, well, we've got a national soccer plan, we can just copy that. It needs to be um, individual and account for the unique differences of what are much larger draw events as the CSL consultant even said, drawing from a much larger region um, for, for those racing events. Um, obviously, there's a lot of other things we're concerned about. None of these community controls will mean anything if Bristol doesn't backstop the debt um, or if Bristol can threaten to terminate the agreement if they don't like a regulation from the fair board. Um, those need to be fixed too. But if you guys get the race car loophole closed and you have a detailed parking plan where Bristol is truly accountable to spend their own money to police uh, parking and control that in the neighborhoods, that'll go a long way towards making this deal work uh, for, for everyone together. Um, and so thank you for your time and look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you again. We have no new business, so I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I'm Chair, I move that we adjourn this meeting. Chair, second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I am an I, and we will therefore adjourn, and we will reconvene with a work session in about 20 minutes, and you can't leave. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.